Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, tens of thousands of people work in Scotland's North Sea oil and gas sector. It raises billions of pounds to support public services, and it's crucial for Scotland's economy. But this week, across the Atlantic in the United States, Hamza Youssef said that Scotland will no longer be the oil and gas capital of Europe. So why is the SNP turned sour on Scotland's oil and gas? Deputy First Minister. Well, we of course um, are committed to a just transition for yep. the oil workers in the North East. And I want to pay tribute to the sector and indeed the workforce yep. for the over £400 billion that they have generated for the UK yep. coffers, yeah, yeah, yeah. much of it of course squandered. But of course, we are committed to a just transition because we know that the unlimited extraction of fossil fuels is not consistent Absolutely. with Scotland's ambitious climate obligations. And we have to ensure a planned and fair transition that leaves no one behind. But I think Douglas Ross is very brave going yeah. on this subject yeah. today. Yeah. In a week where his Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has essentially pulled the rug yeah. from under yeah. the net zero yeah. ambitions, not just Absolutely. of the UK, yeah. but potentially damaging the net zero ambitions of Scotland. Absolutely. And that doesn't just damage the environment, yeah. presiding officer, it damages jobs into yes. the process. Yeah. Yeah. And he should be ashamed to stand side by side with Rishi Sunak on that matter. Yeah. Douglas Ross. What a, predict what a predictable response from the Deputy First Minister, because the SNP love to talk a good game, but keep missing their own climate change targets. And, and the, the Deputy First Minister wants to pay tribute to oil and gas workers in the North Sea. Let's hear one another, please. The Deputy First Minister wants to pay tribute to the oil and gas workers, and Hamza Youssef wants to take their job away. What we need is a transition sensibly to create new energy jobs, not by throwing away the current ones. It's not a choice between oil or renewables. We need to support both. That's why Hamza Yusuf's proposals are so reckless. A recent report from the Robert Gordon University warned that the rapid decline in the oil and gas sector will cost tens of thousands of jobs. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, why is the SNP backing a cliff-edge scenario where skilled jobs will be lost for good? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, it was just a, a year ago that Douglas Ross was urging us to follow Liz Truss over the cliff edge yeah. of her economic catastrophe yeah. for our country. That same Douglas Ross now comes to the chamber today wanting us to follow Rishi Sunak yeah. off the same cliff edge of yeah. reneging and backsliding yeah. on net zero targets. And of course, it's no surprise that one of the first people out of the stocks to support Rishi Sunak was Liz Truss oh, herself. Yeah. So that is the company that Douglas Ross is keeping. Of course, we are committed to a just transition for Scotland's energy sector. And of course, we only just missed our target by 1.2 percentage, which of course shows Members, that we are not far behind. Deputy First Minister, if I may ask you just for a moment. I'm finding it difficult to hear. Um, I think members are being somewhat robust in their engagement with responses, and I would be grateful if we could hear one another speak. Deputy First Minister. Thanks. So I've never allowed a man to shout me down in my life. I will not make any exception for Douglas Ross, presiding officer. But Thank our, you. our targets are world leading, and that's why the First Minister is in New York for the UN Climate Change Week because we are world leading and we have a first minister whose ambitions are to meet the net zero target, showing leadership, unlike the prime minister who is ditching net zero targets. And if he doesn't want to listen to me on that, all he needs to do is to listen to the condemnation from industry, from business, yeah. and indeed from Tory MPs themselves. Yeah. 
Douglas Ross. L let's just go through uh, a few of those points. The Deputy First Minister saying the SNP government's targets are world-leading. They're not meeting them. Eight out of the last 12 years, they failed to meet their own world-leading targets. Uh, and let's listen to industry. Jaguar Land Rover said uh, the plans from the Prime Minister were pragmatic and brings the UK in line with other nations, which we welcome. But, presiding officer, this is not just about what's best for our economy. It's also about what's best for our environment. Mm -hmm. Industry experts have found that new fields at Cambo and Rosebank would save 17 million tonnes of CO2 compared to foreign imports. More production in Scotland is cheaper, greener and protects jobs. But Hamza Youssef no longer wants Scotland to be Europe's capital on oil and gas. And he's against the UK government granting new North Sea licences. So can I just ask the Deputy First Minister, why wouldn't we use our energy on our doorstep instead of costly foreign imports? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, we've been very clear about the, the, the new, any new licences and the climate uh, um, targets that they have to meet in terms of the analysis of those. They have to be robust. And of course, it's not us that will grant any new licences, but the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary have been very, very clear about those climate compatibility tests. But let's get back to the nub of this, because when Douglas Ross talks about our net zero targets, the changes and announcements made by Rishi Sunak make it harder yeah. for us yeah. to achieve our net zero targets. And that is bad for the environment. It's also bad for business. Listen to Lisa Brank in the chair of Ford UK. Yeah. What she said, our business needs three things from the UK government. Ambition, commitment and consistency. Uh -huh. A relaxation of 2030 would undermine all three. Wow. The former Siemens uh, UK CEO, Jürgen Meyer. It's just chaos, isn't it? It beggars belief. Everybody is now sitting, wobbling and wondering. And I can tell you what, they won't be investing in the UK. Wow. It's a disaster for productivity, a disaster for jobs, well-paid jobs, and it's a disaster for business confidence and investment. And we need exactly the opposite. When is Douglas Ross going to grow a backbone and support the net zero targets rather than his prime minister? Yeah. Thank you. And Douglas Ross. Well, we can, we can trade different quotes all day. You know, I can quote Toyota, who said today's government announcement is welcome as it provides the clarity industry has been asking and recognising that all low emission and affordable technologies can have a role to play in a pragmatic vehicle transition. And, and of course, we had... Mr Ross, if you could just give me a moment. Mr Robertson, could I ask you please to remain silent when, when we're trying to hear Mr Ross's response? Douglas Ross. Uh, Angus Robertson's uh, shouting didn't put me off when I beat him in 2017, and it doesn't put me off now. <laughs> I, and I also have to say, it was quite something for Shona Robeson to blame yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister for the SNP failing to meet their targets in eight years out of the last 12. Now, let's go back to where it all began. The SNP's slogan used to be, it's Scotland's oil. Now it's just stop oil. Hamza Youssef <laughs> flew to New York to the finance capital of the world to tell people, don't invest in our oil and gas sector. The First Minister of Scotland is talking Scotland down. It's a slap in the face to North East workers. It's naive because we still rely on oil and gas and it would be a hammer blow to Scotland's economy. So why is the SNP giving up on Scotland's crucial oil and gas sector? Deputy First Minister. Well, no one's giving up on Scotland's oil, but it has been squandered by successive UK governments of all political pillars. As I said at the beginning of my answer, we absolutely um, respect and appreciate the efforts made by the oil and gas sector and their workforce, and we support a just transition that we have put serious money yeah. into making happen, yeah. unlike the UK absolutely. Tory government. Yeah. But listen to what the oil and gas industry are saying. Emma Pinchbecker, the CEO of Energy UK. Sudden changes to policies and targets like this are damaging to the very investment yep. we yeah, need yeah. to fund the move towards yeah. net zero and jeopardise the economic benefits and opportunities this transformation could bring Absolutely. in terms of jobs, growth and greater prosperity to all parts of the country. Business needs certainty and stability when making long-term investments worth billions of pounds. Presiding officer, the announcements by Rishi Sunak 
undermine all of that, yeah. not just for the UK, but for Scotland. And Douglas Ross standing shoulder to shoulder with Rishi Sunak will not be forgiven by the people of Scotland. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. I think, officer, people across our country are paying the price for SNP incompetence and failure at a time when they can't afford it. In every area that this government controls, we see mismanagement leading to billions of pounds of waste. In February 2015, the then Health Secretary Shona Robeson promised to end delay discharge by the end of the year. So can she tell the Chamber, since she made that promise, how many people have died while waiting to leave hospital, how many bed days have been lost, and how much has it cost the taxpayer? Deputy First Minister. Well, first of all, uh, can I say that we absolutely uh, remain committed to um, eradicating delayed discharge. And when I Eight said years. that, uh, when years. I was Health Sec Secretary, we absolutely were determined then as we are now. But Anna Sarwa will understand that it is um, very challenging to do. And back then, of course, we were on the eve of the new integrated joint boards being established, which uh, have... Um, I think it's fair to say, being a, a mixed uh, bag in terms of the delivery of delayed uh, discharge progress, which is why, of course, which is why, of course, we want to move forward with the National Care Service, something which Labour used to support, but as soon as the SNP tried to take it forward, they then opposed. So we'll get on with the job of tackling delayed discharge while Labour just snipe from the sidelines, as always. Anna Sarwar. Senator Officer, the Deputy First Minister is in denial. Nearly four and a half million bed days lost. Over 2,300 people died while waiting to leave hospital. And £1.1 billion wasted. Shona Robeson promised to end this eight years ago, long before COVID. And now people are being asked to pay for that failure during a cost of living crisis. One in four households facing a council tax rise up to 22 per cent, an increase of £740 a year, an income tax rise for people earning as little as £28,000, and now proposing a £15 a day charge to drive to work. Why are working people who have already been hit by the Tory mortgage bombshell being asked to pay the bill for your incompetence and failure? Deputy First Minister. Well, on the issue of the NHS, we absolutely remain uh, committed to eradicating delayed discharge and we work with our partners to do that. But I notice Anna Sarwar just moved on then to talking about uh, local government uh, finance and taxes. So let me say this uh, about, first of all, about the, the council tax uh, multiplier consultation. It is a consultation. It's a consultation based on looking at how we can make the council tax fairer, but also that joint group with COSLA is looking at how we could replace place the council tax going forward. Uh, but, but here is one question that consultation asks. Why is it someone in a banned H property pays so much less as a proportion of their property value than someone in a banned A property? As someone in a higher banned property, I don't think that's fair. Why does Anna Sarwar think that is fair? So we'll get on with the consultation, but it is not credible. It is not credible for Anna Sarwar to come here and say no to progressive taxation when it comes to income tax, no to any changes in terms of local taxation, but demands money be spent on public services. That is not a credible position for Anna Sarwar to take. Anna Sarwar. You've been in government for 16 years, and that's the best answer you can give. The Deputy First Minister just doesn't get it. So let me give her an example. A family in Cambus Lang, the mum's a nurse, dad's a teacher, they've got two young kids. Their energy bill skyrocketed and they're still paying 50% more. That's £2,000. Their food bills are up almost 20%. They've been hit with a mortgage increase of over £2,000 a year. And now the SNP want to make that worse by asking both mum and dad to pay more income tax to pay hundreds of pounds more in council tax yep. and £15 a day to get to the work in yep. Glasgow. This family is being let down by both Tory and SNP incompetence, both making life harder for working people. So why can't the Deputy First Minister see that the people of Scotland are being asked to pay the price for SNP failure? 
Deputy well, First Minister. We do know as Anna Sarwar is now getting his orders from Keir Starmer, and that is to not promise anything in terms of progressive taxation and to turn his back on raising additional funds. Because what Anna Sarwar should remember is that if we had followed what he seems to be suggesting, the Tory tax policies, we would have a billion pounds less for public services in our Let's hear one another. That's what Anna Sarwar seems to be saying. Let me repeat, there is a consultation on council tax. No decisions have been made in terms of council tax increases, and she, he should not be saying to the people of Rutherglen or anywhere else that that is the case, because that is to mislead. But let me say to the nurse and the teacher that Anna Sarwar commented upon, we have, of course, made sure yeah. that nurses are better yes. paid than yeah. elsewhere in these yeah. islands by making sure that we pay through a gender for change. And teachers, of course, are better paid in Scotland than anywhere else in these islands because we settled uh, with the teachers in terms of their pay claim. So we'll get on with paying public workers what they deserve to be paid and supporting household yeah. incomes. And Asarwa will side with the Tories against progressive taxation. What a place for Labour to end up. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. Deputy First Minister. Next Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. Presiding Officer, the list of NHS buildings being searched for the dangerous concrete known as RAC includes surgical wards, a radiotherapy ward, it includes maternity wards and major hospitals like Ninewells in the Deputy First Minister's home city. There, the area of concern extends to 9,500 square metres. That's more than the size of a football pitch. Now, assumptions about what is low risk based on looking at blueprints are now being questioned because a school beam thought to be low risk was then found to be unsound. So can the Deputy First Minister vouch for the safety of everyone going for surgery, every cancer patient and every newborn currently receiving care in a ward where this concrete is suspected to be present? Deputy First Minister. Well, look, let me say to Alex Cole Hamilton, first of all, that NHS are sure have been going through all of the buildings in the NHS looking at applying, of course, the guidance from the Institute of Structural Engineers, yeah. making sure that there is then a risk rating uh, for any buildings that need that repair, but no building and no patients and no staff will be left in any dangerous building uh, anywhere, and, and we shouldn't suggest that yeah. because that worries people. Yeah, so now, bad. Alex Cold Hamilton, I understand, was spoken to by the Health Secretary <laughs> about this very matter yes, just yesterday, yes, um, but if he still has queries, I'm sure the Health Secretary will, will be prepared to speak to him again. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice and Education have also invited him to a meeting to discuss any other further concerns. But it is important that we give the assurance to the public yeah. that all of these matters are absolutely in hand and that the guidance from the Institute of Structural Engineers is being followed. Yeah. And hopefully that's something that Alex Cole Hamilton can join us in giving that reassuring message on. Question number four, Colette Stevenson. To ask the Deputy First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact of the rollout of the carer support payment on the national mission to tackle poverty and reduce inequality. Deputy First Minister. We know that unpaid carers face a higher risk of poverty and the majority of unpaid carers are women. Uh, carer support payment will be available in the local authority areas of Dundee, Perth and Kinross and Western Isles from November this year and will be extended to more areas from spring 2024 to be available nationally by autumn 2024. The carer support payment will extend eligibility to more carers carers studying full time. It will remove barriers to education, provide more stable support, promote increased take up and help carers access wider benefits and services. And once case transfer from carers allowance completes, it will also provide extra parent payments to carers with multiple caring roles and an additional four weeks of support when a caring role ends due to bereavement. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that response. I am particularly pleased to note the expanded eligibility of carers' support payment compared to the DWP's 
carers allowance. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how many additional carers, compared to the rest of the UK, are set to benefit from Social Security Scotland's 14th devolved payment? Deputy First Minister. So, despite our uh, fixed budgets and limited powers, we have transformed social security provision in Scotland, delivering a radically different system based on dignity, fairness and respect. Uh, from launch, our carer support payment will expand access to uh, many uh, carers, um, widening access to 1,500 more carers once the benefit is available nationally. Carers on uh, carer support payment will also continue to benefit from our carers allowance supplement, which has provided extra support to carers in Scotland since 2018, and will again call on the UK Government to match our actions to address the fact that carers allowance is, of course, the lowest of all working age benefits. Rose McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I note the Deputy First Minister's reply and the subsequent Westminster bad response. But if I could draw the focus back to Scotland and to reducing inequalities, the 2023 programme for government, where there was a promise to develop a payment for eligible 16 to 25 year olds with care experience to provide transition security for independent living. Deputy First Minister, we're a year on. When will the promise be fulfilled? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I say to Ros McCall, it's not about Westminster bad, it was just a fact that the carer's allowance is the lowest of all working yeah. age benefits. That's just a fact. Yeah. Um, can I say to her on her question uh, about uh, the rollout of the, the, the benefit for uh, young carers, uh, I will ensure that the Minister writes to her with, with an update in terms of the progress and timetable for that. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reported comments from COSLA and Council leaders questioning the achievability of net zero targets without a detailed plan and adequate funding. <laughs> um, I would be grateful if we could do members the courtesy of hearing their questions. Deputy First Minister. Oh, I'm sure Brian Whittle must be regretting submitting that question. Yeah, uh, so, a Tory MSP uh, raising net zero less than 24 hours after the Tory Prime Minister uh, hollowed out their plans uh, is a, a matter for pity, perhaps. We'll continue yeah. to work in partnership with local authorities and COSLA to develop a framework between national and local government to agree shared approaches to delivering net zero. And we're doing this at a time when the UK government appears determined to undermine the, that means to to deliver the change. The Prime Minister's decision to renege on the UK's key net zero commitments yesterday was a, an unforgivable betrayal of current and future generations. The Conservatives are trading the future of our planet for a cheap electoral ploy, presiding yeah. officer. So I'd like to say to Brian Whittle, if he or his colleagues in the Scottish Tories have any influence with the UK Government, unlikely, then please urge them to rethink because you're on the wrong side of history. Yeah. Brian Whittle. Presiding officer, is the First Minister grandstands in New York accusing the rest of the world of catastrophic negligence and climate change? His SNP councillors have joined COSLA, the Committee on Climate Change and countless other organisations to criticise his government's net zero plans. Yeah. The SNP Green Government love being praised for their bold, ambitious climate policies, but those same policies keep disintegrating on contact with reality. A just transition requires more than ever grander promises, with no thought on how they work in the real world. Will the Deputy First Minister now commit to setting out a detailed, pragmatic and achievable roadmap to Scottish Government net zero, or will she continue the First Minister's approach of bashing others to disguise his Government's failures? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, it's the Prime Minister's announcements that are disintegrating in the face of blistering criticisms, yeah. not just from industry, not just from business, but from some of his own members. Yeah. And I just wonder how Maurice Golden is feeling uh, yeah. at this yeah. point yeah. and yeah. others on the Tory backbenches. So the First Minister will continue, as the Scottish Government will, presiding officers, to show leadership on net yeah. zero. We are regarded throughout the world as having some of the most ambitious targets and ambitious policies. We will get on with the job and we will leave Rishi Sunak, Douglas Ross and the Tories to try and explain to future generations why they had no backbone when it yeah. comes to the environment. I call Audrey Nicholl. 
Thank you. Uh, staying on the theme of Rishi Sunak's plan to ditch the UK government's key net zero targets, can I ask the Deputy First Minister what initial assessment can the Scottish Government provide on the impact that this will have on the commitment and consistency that industry requires from the Government to ensure a just energy transition? Deputy First Minister. So I'm aware that the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero will be uh, answering an urgent question on this later today. Um, the Prime Minister's reckless plans have already, of course, been branded concerning by the Climate Change Committee, who judge it, quotes, likely to take the UK further away from being able to meet its legal commitments. Business and consumer groups alike have referred to the plans as hugely damaging and a colossal error, and Al Gore has called them shocking and hugely disappointing. There are many others I could, uh, I could quote. I know the Tories don't like uh, the facts to be presented to them. But the key point here and the most serious concerning point is that these announcements will have a serious impact and implication not just for the UK's but for Scotland's climate ambitions as well. And that is unforgivable, presiding officer. Mark Roscoe. The Prime Minister's climb down on climate show that he's a politician who is only interested in the next election rather than the next generation. So can I ask, what impact his announcement will have on Scotland's plans to reach net zero by 2045? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, uh, uh, he is absolutely right. And we will, of course, assess that. The Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero will answer that urgent question. But we will, of course, have to get into the detail of assessing what that impact is. And of course, he's absolutely right. The member's right to point to what this is all about. This is all about the general election and the Tories trying to appeal to their core vote, which is essentially culture wars, anti-migrants and now anti-environment. Yeah. What an unappealing, negative, yeah. backward-looking, small-minded prospectus that is, presiding yeah. officer, and it will be roundly rejected by the Scottish people once again. Yeah. Question number six, Paul O'Kane. To to ask the Deputy First Minister whether the Scottish Government will consider writing off school meal debts in light of reports of local authorities instructing sheriff officers to pursue families for unpaid school meal debt. Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, we recognise that the cost of living crisis is, of course, putting a huge strain on families and many are facing real challenges. And we are committed to, of course, expansion of free school meals, saving families £400 per year for every eligible child. And where any family is experiencing difficulties due to the costs of paying for school meals, in the first instance, we expect local authorities to use the powers available to them and to provide necessary support. And while school meal debt is a matter for councils, the Scottish Government will do everything we can to support families and will consider all options available to us to ensure families don't find themselves punished for struggling during a cost of living crisis. Paul O'Kane. Organisations like Aberlour Children's Charity speak of a cycle of problem debt owed to public bodies trapping families in poverty. Not only are families experiencing the stress of being trapped in this cycle, but we have now learned that councils like Renfrewshire and my region are sending debt collectors to families' doors, exacerbating unimaginable pressure when they are just trying to get by in a cost of living crisis. Despite what the Deputy First Minister says about causal -like guidance and managing school debt, families are now in a postcode lottery, with some councils writing it off and others resorting to debt collectors. 50 anti-poverty organisations and trade unions wrote to the Deputy First Minister's predecessor calling for action in the last budget. And Scottish Labour outlined plans to write off school debt in our call for an emergency cost of living act in the summer of 2022. The former First Minister said that she was sympathetic Question, and asked please. the officials to look at the issue. Sympathy, warm words, another year of inaction from the government. All Question, the while, please, the debt Mr. collectors O'Kane. are banging on the door. So if reducing poverty is a defining Mr. mission of O'Kane, O'Kane, you government, can put your question now or not at all. Action and provide resource to allow all councils to write off these debts and stop the sheriff officers. Deputy First Minister. Um, well, first of all, of course, um, to fund an emergency cost of living act, you would need to have progressive taxation, whether at a national level or local level. And of course, Labour have now ruled that out. So there is no more funds to pay for any emergency cost of living act or anything else. 
And also, uh, on this point, there is a lack of consistency from Labour here, because also the two child cap and rape clause don't help yeah. vulnerable families either. So we need to see some consistency from Labour. On the point about debt, it is a, an important point, and I would encourage councils to have consistency in uh, applying the guidance to whether it's school meal debt or any other debt. And they should do that in a way that preserves the dignity of families. And we will continue to work with COSLA on that important matter. Yeah. Liam Kerr. Very grateful. The Scottish Government's failure to fully implement its free school meals promise is relevant here. And the Education Committee heard just yesterday from SIPFA that government funding for the free school meals that are in place is insufficient. So, Deputy First Minister, why is this government failing to properly fund its own scheme? Yeah. Deputy First Minister. Scotland has the most generous free school meal provision in the UK and we are going even further. Liam Kerr or any other Tory member cannot pitch up here demanding more money for free school meals or anything else when through their tax cuts that they wanted us to follow there would be a billion pounds less money, a billion pounds less Members. money to spend on public services whether it's free school meal provision or anything else. So don't turn up here asking for more money when you want to take a billion pounds out of the money we already have. We'll now move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cancer Research UK announced a £123 million investment in the Cancer Research UK Scotland Institute, formerly known as Cancer Research UK Beetson Institute, based at University of Glasgow's Garskewd campus in my constituency. The Beetson name is synonymous with cancer research in the west of Scotland and the amazing work of the Beetson Institute has been life-changing for many. What can the Deputy First Minister say about the significance of this investment, particularly for the west of Scotland and the strengths in cancer research and life science we have in constituencies like mine? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, can I uh, say to, to Rona Mackay, I really very much welcome Cancer Research UK's announcement of this significant investment. Research is vital if new approaches to prevention, diagnosis and treatment of cancer are to continue to be developed. And this funding will ensure that the Institute continues this research in the west of Scotland. The Institute is recognised internationally for its quality, innovation and impact. And the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, met with the Chief Executive Officer of Cancer Research UK yesterday to discuss the work of the Institute and recognise Cancer Research's very welcome investment. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week we learned the disappointing news of more Bank of Scotland branch closures, uh, including one in Millport on Cumbria and Broadick on Arran. These are actually the last remaining bank branches on those island communities. Whilst this is disappointing news for elderly residents on islands and many businesses who operate in cash, uh, I wonder if it's escaped the Lloyds Banking Group, a group that received a £20 billion taxpayer-funded bailout many years ago, uh, of the devastating effect this will have for our island communities. Will Scottish Government ministers join me in lobbying this banking group to reverse these devastating cuts to branches? Deputy First Minister. Uh, so can I agree with Jamie Green, actually? I think uh, these services are important, particularly for those who don't have online banking facilities, and many older people are, are in that position. Uh, so um, the sentiment, absolutely, I agree with, obviously, is a UK government responsibility, but uh, in, in terms of his call for us to uh, have a cross-party representation, I'm very happy to ask Neil Gray uh, to speak to Jamie Green to see how that can be arranged. Alec Crowley. Thank you, President Officer. Given the level of skill shortages across the Scottish economy, is the Deputy First Minister concerned that colleges are cutting courses and making staff redundant in order to balance their budgets? Deputy First Minister. Well, skills and the future of skills is absolutely critical, which of course is why the Withers Review is so critical going forward and the college sector will be absolutely critical in that. There has been a 
challenges to public finances across all public bodies. Uh, no one is denying that due to UK uh, government austerity. And we have to therefore make sure that whether it's the college sector or any other sector uh, is delivering within the budgets uh, that can be allocated. But uh, in terms of skills, we absolutely recognise the importance of skills for the economy going forward. And that's why we are keen to see that review and uh, forward, forward looking review from uh, Weathers uh, taken forward in a way that sees the colleges at the heart of that. Stuart McMillan. The officer, the Deputy First Minister will recognise that this week is National Eye Health Week. As the convener of the Cross Party Group on Visual Impairment, I'm pleased that this Parliament has led the way with a long standing policy of free eye tests. Would the Deputy First Minister support calls to encourage more Scots to utilise the free eye test as it can have multiple health benefits to the individual? Deputy First Minister. Well, uh, I certainly agree with uh, Stuart McMillan that National Eye, Week, uh, Eye Health Week sorry, is a, a timely opportunity to highlight the importance of having a free, regular NHS eye examination and contacting an optometrist as the first port of call for any eye problem. We know that it can provide a, a full health check of the eyes as well as a sight test, and this can help to detect early signs of sight-threatening uh, conditions as well as other serious health conditions. And I'm proud that Scotland remains the only uh, part of these islands to provide free universal NHS eye examinations, and the Scottish Government is committed to uh, maintaining this. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Scottish Government rejected calls from across this chamber and from industry to pause the licensing scheme for short-term lets because of the emerging unintended consequences. Yesterday, we saw yet more confusion about this policy, with the Times newspaper reporting that Homelink, who arranged house swaps, had been told by ministers that swaps would now be excluded from the rules. We also learned that the Deputy First Minister herself wrote to councils in March saying that guidance would be produced offering temporary exemptions for house swaps, but there is no record of such guidance ever being published. Meanwhile, the Housing Minister, who replied to the debate last week, seemed to be unaware of any of this. So can I get some clarity, please? Are house swaps to be excluded from the licensing scheme? Yes or no? And doesn't this demonstrate, once again, this is a shambolic policy from a government where the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing? Deputy First Minister. Well, I'll certainly get um, Shirley Ann Somerville as the Social Justice Secretary uh, to write to the member because it is important that there's clarity on this matter. Murdo Fraser is, is Let's right, hear the Deputy uh, First Minister. is right to raise that. And I'll make sure that that is made not just available to Murdo Fraser, but to other members across uh, the chamber. But in terms of the, the policy per se, uh, what is important that Murdo Fraser and others do is to encourage uh, those who are running short-term lets to now get their licence in order by the 1st of October, uh, because that will be critical in making sure that what this is all about at the end of the day is that whoever uh, is using a short-term let in whatever sector can be guaranteed of the same safety measures applying no matter where they are staying. That is at the heart of what this is about. But on that specific point, I'll make sure the Cabinet Secretary uh, writes to the member and puts that uh, across to other MSPs as well. Rhoda Grant. The Deputy First Minister will be aware that Highland Council has cancelled 10 new school buildings, and this also means that desperately needed affordable housing will be lost. It's due to delays with her government's learning estate investment programme. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, will she now make decisions about this fund so that local authorities can build schools? And will she apologise to pupils, parents, teachers and communities that have been so badly affected? Deputy First Minister. Well, uh, first of all, of course, the, um, the LEAP project has been uh, enormously uh, important in terms of the phases one and two, and uh, 37 projects were announced, including three in the Highlands through those first two phases. In terms of the third phase, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education will be uh, updating uh, Parliament uh, in due course, but of course one of the issues we've had to look at is the position of RAC schools in relation to that phase three and to make sure that they receive the priority that they require. What I would just finally say uh, to the member is this, that despite our 
our uh, cut to capital budgets. And going forward, that will be a cut of seven, nearly 7%, 7 per cent, 6.7 per cent. That makes it very, very difficult, whether it's building schools, hospitals or anything else. So I would hope the member would join with us in making sure that we um, say to the UK government that we absolutely need uh, that investment in capital in the same way as the Welsh Labour government have said. And I just met with the Treasury with the Welsh Labour government yesterday and we are saying exactly the same. It's just a pity that Labour members in this place are not aligning with our Welsh Labour colleagues. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. One year after Liz Truss's disastrous Tory UK mini budget, can the Deputy First Minister outline the impact of this chaotic event on Scotland's economy? Deputy First Minister. Well, the disastrous mini budget, enthusiastically backed by the Scottish Tories, of yeah. course, Douglas Ross in particular, sent shockwaves through the economy, causing market interest rates to jump, sterling to fall, and literally crashed the pension market in the UK. Yeah. Alongside this, the proposed tax cuts and the market reaction reduced any lingering credibility that the UK had in terms of economic management, which was already severely damaged by Brexit. Uh, this, of course, is now being followed by the equivalent to that by Rishi Sunak on net zero. Of course, Liz Truss being the biggest cheerleader for the backsliding and reneging on those net zero targets. So if there was an argument for independence, presiding officer, what has happened with net zero this week, surely there can be no better argument that control over net zero and the economy should rest here in this parliament. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Deputy First Minister, this week Clackmannishire Council admitted that a house which caught fire was not fitted with the legally required interlinked heat and smoke alarms, despite legislation requiring this from February 2022. This may not be an isolated incident, and it may be putting vulnerable tenants and elderly at risk. Therefore, Deputy First Minister, what urgent action can the Scottish Government put in place to ensure that councils are fulfilling their legal responsibilities and protecting tenants and lives? Deputy First Minister. Well, um, can I say to Alexander, sure, I'm concerned to hear about that. And of course, councils absolutely should uh, be making sure that they apply the legislation in the same way uh, as anyone else. If Alexander Stewart wants to uh, write to me with those details, that's certainly something that we can raise uh, with uh, the council, uh, because it's very important that tenants uh, feel safe in their homes. Mercedes Vialba. I refer members to my register of interest as a trade union member. This week, members of UCU, Unison and Unite the Union are on strike at the University of Dundee because their employer has repeatedly failed to make a fair pay offer. Year on year, real terms pay cuts are harming university workers, student learning and our education system. Deputy First Minister, will you join me in urging university principals in our city of Dundee and across the country to meet the demands of campus unions? Deputy First Minister. Well, uh, of course, uh, this uh, is a, a matter for uh, Dundee University or any other universities in terms of them being independent institutions and the way that they conduct uh, industrial relations. However, we would expect them to follow uh, the Fair Work principles in terms of good engagement with the unions and we would, ex we would uh, expect them to uh, follow those in the same way uh, as other uh, institutions uh, should. So we would urge them to continue uh, to get round the table with the union partners to try to find a resolution. I would just say to Mercedes Vialba though that what we are seeing from Keir Starmer is a complete retreat from workers' rights. Yeah. Uh, a U-turn on every commitment in terms of workers' rights. So perhaps she should have a word uh, with Keir Starmer or I suspect she probably doesn't agree with him anyway. But in terms of the devolution of employment law, I hope she will sign the motion that is up for debate next week because I understand Anna Sauer has sent a memo round saying Labour Members. MPs shouldn't sign it. Hopefully Mercedes Viaba will sign it. So I know she's of independent mind. I call Jeremy Balfour. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Deputy First Minister, can change of mine, who is a single mother with a short-term let property, has been in touch with me this week. She will shortly be obliged to display a licence notice to the front window of a property to be compliant with the short-term let regulations that includes her name, and address. She is concerned about her well-being and privacy of her daughter and herself due to her domestic relationship. 
can the Deputy First Minister confirm whether it is her intention for short-term let regulations to make responsible owners afraid and scared and possibly having to withdraw the property? And will she look at again whether this type of privacy is appropriate in Scotland today? Deputy First Minister. Uh, no, and uh, if Jeremy Balfour wants to furnish us with the case, um, we will look at it in terms of what the guidance has been issued from Edinburgh uh, City Council. No one should be afraid and scared. What we're asking here is for short-term let uh, owners to get a licence on basic safety measures. That's all. Not to put themselves in a position of a, being afraid or scared. This is about basic safety standards. But if Jeremy Balfour wants to furnish us with the details, if the there's an issue in terms of the guidance that's been issued by Edinburgh. We will look at that. But uh, that's all I can offer, I think, at this stage, Presiding Officer. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Conservatives delivered a ruinous Brexit. And this week, Keir Stammer says he will tweak that ruinous Brexit while ruling out a return to the European single market. He stated his... Uh, priorities were economic growth and the opportunities and the outcomes for young people that were lost through Brexit. Does the DFM, does Deputy First Minister agree with me that the only way to get the benefits of the European Union back is for Scotland to be there as an independent nation and a back to the family of nations of Europe? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, Claire Adamson's exactly right, and it appears to me that Labour don't like to hear the word Brexit even more than the Tories don't like to hear the word Brexit. I wonder why that is. But Brexit is an ongoing disaster for Scotland, and the Labour Party now members and wants to keep Scotland out of the hugely important European single market and out of the European Customs Union. And of course, it backs the end of freedom of movement, which was so important for the Scottish economy. And the real question here for Labour, though, is when the onslaught of workers' rights begins, are they going to look trade unions in the eye or workers in the eye and say, that's OK, we support that, we don't care about workers' rights? Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Jackie Dunbar. And there will now be a short suspension to allow members to leave the chamber and the public to leave the gallery.